I, I take this pretty seriously. So why is a cardiologist talking to you about the liver? Well, um, well I kind of like all of general medicine. So while I am a cardiologist, I say I'm a general medic at heart, really. Uh, and card you know, cardiologists, we know a little bit of medicine. We had to do it at some point. Uh, and you know, that we are aware there are other organs in the body. Um, I'm going to split this like last time. I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to turn off the chat because I just don't have the space on my screen. I'll look at the chat intermittently. Uh, but if there are any questions, please put them there. And if you need them answering, I will try and get to them at the end. Okay, I'm going to split this talk a little bit. Uh, I've never done anything like this. I make the slides fresh, basically, for every talk. So I'm going to do hepatomegaly for clinical medicine, hepatomegaly for finals, and then I'm going to do a little bit of hepatomegaly for SBAs and questions, because I kind of have a different perspective on all of those. Clinical medicine is me just talking to you as a doctor. Let's just pretend this was not in preparation for the great game and dance of doing medical finals as an OSCE, and let's just pretend you were actually being, you know, a doctor. Uh, just for the sake of argument. Now, if you're with me in a &E and we have a patient in, uh, in with hepatomegaly, this is kind of how my brain looks at that situation, all right? I want to know, is there jaundice? That's kind of a key question because it'll tell me straight away whether this is mainly a liver problem or whether this might be an actual extra hepatic issue causing hepatomegaly. And that can be lots of things. We're going to get to the differentials in a bit. I want to know if it's painful. It's an absolutely critical question if the hepatomegaly is tender or not. Okay, someone's not muted themselves. Uh, let me just... Okay, everyone is muted. Sorry, guys, it's just... Uh, no, so someone is not muted. Let's mute that person. Okay, fine. Whether hepatomegaly is tender or not is an absolutely critical question because it really narrows down your differentials. First of all, it tells you how rapidly the hepatomegaly developed. If they've got painful hepatomegaly, it's much more likely that that situation arose in the recent kind of past, like less than a week, maybe maximum two weeks. It's been fairly recent. And the reason for that is that when the liver enlarges, the stretching of the liver capsule, which is this kind of uh, subcutaneous tissue and stuff that's just around the liver, uh, when that stretches acutely, the liver doesn't have time to accommodate that. Your nociceptor kind of receptors for pain get, get uh, activated. So you will feel tender hepatomegaly when you've got a rapid short-term enlargement of the liver, when it's just happened basically in a very short amount of time. And if it's painful, and therefore we're assuming it's rapid, that narrows down to just a couple of things. It's either going to be hepatitis, which could be viral or alcoholic, depending on which part of the world you're in, or it could be right heart failure. That's the only other real cause for a tender hepatomegaly. Now, there are lots of causes of right heart failure, all the way from heart attack, silent MI, where the guy just comes in with a tender hepatomegaly, and that's the pain he's got, but the no pain in the chest, all the way to endocarditis, so a right-sided valve, to multiple other causes in the heart that can cause right heart failure. But viral hepatitis and alcoholic hepatitis are clearly commoner. And I would venture to guess that most people listening to me will encounter alcoholic hepatitis, the commonest of them all, right? Uh, and I think that's pretty much fair for everyone. I have to uh, keep bearing in mind that I know there's like six people listening to me from South Africa and like 15 people from Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So I know there's some, uh, the, everyone's from a slightly different region. Most people here are from the UK and most of us and in Australia and South Africa, I imagine most people will encounter in the typical westernized urban setting, alcoholic hepatitis is the commonest cause of hepatomegaly, which is tender. Oh, sorry, I jumped past this point. Nodularity. Now, you will hear uh, medics and gastroenterologists, and uh, you'll see in final year textbooks this particular thing being made a big song and dance about, the nodularity about how nodular the liver feels. I have to say it's a really weak sign. There have been lots of studies looking at how useful is the detection of a nodular liver with your fingertips, how useful is that as a sign? First of all, it's really non-insensitive. So you could have a nodular liver that most people would just miss. So it, there, is a, there is a better than 50% chance that you just you don't have the dexterity or skill in your hands to pick it up. And that's not just you, that's most doctors, that's me as well. So I think it's a pretty weak sign. If you find it, then it's important to note it. Uh, and you should always mention in a clinical setting, in an exam setting, that you're looking for it for a nodular liver, because it means a couple of things. Again, I'm going to come back to what it means when we do 
the hepatosplenomegaly, uh, sorry, hepatomegaly for finals uh, bid, which is coming up. But it is a pretty weak sign clinically. I don't uh, particularly rate it. I have to say I've seen lots of general medicine in my time. And most people I've seen have cirrhosis with the hepatomegaly. And while nodularity is a sign of cirrhosis, among other things, I've never ever felt it, even though the ultrasound will later tell me there is lots of nodularity in this liver, but my hands didn't pick it up. Now that could just be my hands, but from my ex experience, most doctors can't pick this up. It's a pretty weak sign. So while it's there as a, as a bit of fascination in textbooks, I don't think in clinical practice, it's actually particularly useful. One sign that is incredibly useful and incredibly sensitive and specific and can be done by everyone, like it's a really easy sign to see at the bedside, but I have to say most doctors don't do it, is the hepatojugular reflux. And yeah, I know this is in cardiology, but this is one of the most useful signs in clinical medicine. I find this incredibly useful at the bedside. I don't know a single doctor who doesn't know how to do this once I show them how to do this. It's really easy. You don't need magic ears and hearing murmurs and all that. You're just looking for something in the neck. Uh, hepatojugular reflux is, done, is taught poorly at medical school. I know because I did not learn it at medical school. I learned it much, after, uh, much kind of years after. So... The way you do hepatojugular reflux is this. You press the liver or the abdomen for 15 seconds. You can press on the tummy. Pressing on the liver in someone with tender hepatomegaly will make them scream. So it's not ideal, but pressing anywhere in the abdomen will elicit this sign. If you press for 15 seconds and the JVP rises by more than three centimeters, and when you let go after 15 seconds, if it stays up greater than three centimeters for at least 10 seconds, that's a very, very, very specific sign for right ventricular impairment. It's incredibly specific. It's actually a great sign for heart failure at the bedside. Now, if you don't have an echo machine to hand and you don't have uh, an echo cardiogram available at 2 a.m. in district general, blah, 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 it's just not something feasible. And you've got a guy who's breathless who's just come in with pedal edema. This sign will tell you straight away whether their heart can tolerate a bit of extra uh, venous return. That's all you're doing. This is you pressing on the tummy. That increases the blood returning to the superior and inferior vena cava, mainly inferior, right? Uh, and what you're getting is a rise in JVP because the heart's failing to accommodate that extra venous return. And if it stays up for more than 10 seconds after you've pressed for 15, then that's a pretty good sign that this guy's heart, and in specifically the right ventricle, although it's probably congestive cardiac, it's probably both, um, specifically the right ventricle cannot accommodate increased venous return. Therefore, this guy definitely has heart failure. There's no doubt about it. There may be other things going on, but this sign at the bedside will tell you straight away if this is heart failure. And it's a cause of, um, uh, it's a cause of tender hepatomegaly as well. So it's a useful one to know. I have to say, most people don't do this very well. I did not do this until I became a cardiology registrar and like two years in after doing lots of reading and kind of being around consultants and professors, you kind of, you know, you pick these things up. It's really weird how we're kind of taught quite random things. I can see the chats kind of coming up with lots of things. I can't open it because otherwise it'll take up more of my screen. So I, I'm not looking at the chat right now, guys. I promise I will in a bit. I promise. So I did mention that hepatomegaly nodularity is a weak sign. We do need to know the differentials, mainly for your medical final OSCEs, because it's often something that we like to ask about. Weirdly enough, when I examine for finals, they don't actually give me cardiology. They prefer not to, because it's a real weird quirk in medical finals and surgical finals. They try to avoid the speciality of the doctor. So a cardiologist will not be asked to examine cardiology. They feel it's a bit unfair because... It's like if you get a neurology professor to examine neurology, it's a little bit unfair. You should get an acute medic or a general medic. So there's like a, you know, you don't want kind of insane level of depth of knowledge. You want someone who's knows enough to be a general medic. So they will get me to examine random things. And I have examined for uh, the GI system and the GI medical case many, many times now. So one of the questions that uh, we frequently ask in that situation is differentials for a nodular uh, liver. Which, are, which is a non-smooth edge. Most livers meant to have a smooth edge, but if you can feel, and like I said, it's very, very unlikely that you will with your hands, but let's say you can, uh, the nodularity of a liver with your hand, there are two differentials. Number one is malignancy. Yeah, that should be fairly obvious. If you've got abnormal growth, which is just kind of a tumor on a side of a liver or malignancy, then you can have this non-smooth edge, which makes sense. The other one is cirrhosis. And the reason for that is that you get these uh, regenerative nodules on the liver with chronic cirrhosis because of chronic inflammation and repair, and it just keeps going through this process. Here's an interesting one that most people, again, are not aware of. If you have cirrhosis of the liver causing hepatomegaly, yeah, and whatever the cause of the cirrhosis is, it doesn't matter whether it's alcoholic 
or whether it's a viral infection or whatever, the left lobe of the liver preferentially enlarges in cirrhosis. This is a very well-recognized thing among hepatologists that the left lobe and the caudate lobe actually as well in preference enlarges over the right in cirrhosis of the liver. What that means to you as a, as a finally a medical student is simply this. If you're looking for hepatomegaly in a patient who at the bedside, you can see leukonychia, you can see that they've got a bit of a liver flap, uh, asterixis, you can see that they've got spider nevi, et cetera, et cetera. You can see the full house of signs at the bedside. You can tell looking at this patient, this is a liver patient, right? If you can see that, then all you really need to think is, do they have a big liver that I can just about touch or feel? Sometimes it's massive, but sometimes it's very subtle. And the best place you're likely to find it is just under the xiphysternum, because that's where the left lobe will enlarge, right? So you're more likely to feel it there coming down. So try not to have your hand all the way over to the right. So you want to have it somewhere in the middle where your fingertips can just feel under the xiphysternum as well, because that's where that left lobe will enlarge and come down with the uh, respiration. By the way, I'm not going to teach you, hopefully uh, you don't expect me to do this, but the basics of how to examine a liver, like feeling and it moves down with the inspiration. So you have to push up as the patient breathes and blah, blah, blah. I am hoping everyone who's listening to me, I'm very clear this is for finals. I'm hoping most people know how to examine for a liver. So I'm going to skip that in, uh, in excruciating depth and just give you the tips. I have to say I use the scratch test all the time and it's way, way more useful than using my hands to feel for a liver. Scratch test you may not have heard of. I don't blame you if you haven't. It's in some of the books, it's not in all of the books and it's not a standard thing everyone teaches. So I, I completely appreciate most people may not have heard of this. Okay, Num rule number one, with the scratch test, don't actually scratch the patient. You don't wanna do that because it'll just make them scream and that's not helping you pass the final exam. All the scratch test is, is this. You put your stethoscope during the auscultation bit, you put the stethoscope just over where the liver should be, like you'd be listening for a hepatic brewery. You can just put your stethoscope there and you can quietly, without saying a word to the examiner, just move your finger up the, uh, up the abdominal wall from the right iliac fossa upward. And as you go up, just, just basically gently, yeah, I'm just scratching my microphone. You're just rubbing on the skin with your fingertip. That's it, not using your nail. If, as you go up, you do that. As soon as you hit a solid organ underneath, the sound will transmit a lot louder. That's called the scratch test. And it's very sensitive for picking up the lower order. This is for people who have cold hands and they feel like, oh, my hands are never good at feeling for things. And palpation is something I suck at. This is a really sensitive way of picking up when there's a liver edge just underneath the costal margin and you just can't feel it. For whatever reason, maybe you have cold uh, extremities and just don't have good sensation or whatever, or you just feel like you're not very confident with it. This is a very sensitive way of picking it up. As soon as you scratch or rather rub the skin and you are just over the edge of the liver, as soon as you get there, the sound will become a lot louder. You can test this on yourself. Not right now because you're listening to me, but later on, take your stethoscope, put it over your right uh, costal margin and just go up your abdomen with your finger, just gently rubbing the skin. And you'll see as soon as you hit the costal margin, hopefully because you don't have hepatomegaly, you will find that the sound becomes a lot louder. And that's the scratch test. It's a really sensitive way of looking for it. The scratch test is not so useful for the upper border. For the upper border, you need to percuss, but it's something you must never forget to do, even if you're bad at percussion. I can't give the marks in medical finals unless people are looking for the upper border as well as the lower border. You need to look for both because you cannot look for hepatomegaly unless you look for both. Technically speaking, the liver should be at least above 12 centimeters, above 12.5 centimeters technically uh, is hepatomegaly. But of course, these things vary depending on your body surface area, et cetera. Generally speaking, most people would agree that above 12 centimeters, it's a pretty big liver. So that's uh, generally regarded as hepatomegaly. Not that we would ever expect you to measure it in the finals, at least not in London. Never, ever forget to, uh, to dip. You'll have your own kind of way of doing things. You'll say, okay, I want to examine the external genitalia, blah, 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 the hernia orifices, blah, blah. But the urine dipstick is incredibly important. One thing in medicine finals I should tell you is that anytime you name a test, you should be prepared for why do you want to do that test? And that's an important thing. So anything you say, you have to be able to back it up. Otherwise, you're just kind of throwing tests at the wall. Uh, for random reasons. And then you're not being a doctor, you're being an American doctor, which is just requesting tests for no good reason. You need to know why you're doing your test. Sorry, I don't mean to slag off the Americans here. It's just uh, something uh, we do at work, which is kind of mean. Okay, that's a, it's, a, it's also very unfair. So 
glycosuria is an incredibly important thing to pick up simply for the reason that if you find glucose in the urine, then you've picked up probably diabetes and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is associated with type 2 diabetes mellitus, is one of the commonest causes and probably in the next 10 years will become the number one cause for cirrhosis in the Western world. It's already kind of top three and it's probably massively underdiagnosed. And we suspect that the people who have this non-alcoholic steatohepatitis causing cirrhosis almost certainly have already got cirrhosis. They just don't have the clinical signs. So they're probably out there in their 40s, 50s with diabetes and probably later on in life, a cirrhosis will become evident. And we're gonna find that this is a massively underdiagnosed problem. Basically, when you go looking for this thing, you find it everywhere. Surgeons love this for the abdominal surgical case. It comes up frequently. And I say this because one of my good buddies is a surgical examiner. He says he loves asking this question in the, uh, in the abdomen case. Uh, he asks about the blood supply of the liver. He likes students to know that livers have a dual blood supply. And most of the blood, 75% to 80%, comes from the portal vein. The rest is from the hepatic artery. So it's just, it's, I'm just throwing it in there because I spoke to a buddy that I was going to do a hepatomegaly talk. And he said, well, for a surgical perspective, this is the thing I really like my students to know. Uh, and I ask this all the time in surgical finals. So just saying it, <laughs> it comes up and uh, actually come to think of it in my medical finals or surgical finals. I remember this as well coming up. It was something that was, I was asked about. When you come to auscultate the abdomen, obviously you'll do your kind of standard thing. You look for bruise in the right places. You'll, you know, you'll listen for bowel sounds, etc. Don't forget to look for a hepatic brewery. A hepatic brewery is actually quite a good sign for hepatocellular cancer. However, you can also get a brewery with acute alcoholic hepatitis, acute alcoholic hepatitis, not chronic. So your patient who's smiling in front of you without abdominal pain shouldn't really have a brewery. If they're in, in A&E, unwell with tender hepatomegaly after an alcohol binge, then a brewery might make sense because it's probably alcoholic hepatitis. Of course, in either case, you'd want to do an ultrasound. Spleens are generally harder to find. I do think percussing in the Traub space is incredibly sensitive. Um, and I do think it's, again, something that most people are not taught very well how to do. Simply put, when you're percussing uh, the abdomen, take two seconds to percuss just between the sixth rib and the lowest rib on the left side. And if that percussion note is dull, an inspiration or expression, it doesn't really matter, then that's a good sign that the spleen is enlarged. Normally that should be resonant. It's between the sixth rib and the last rib. That's a fairly sensitive sign for splenomegaly. And of course, spleens are just hard to feel. Uh, and that's not just because spleens are hard to feel in everyone. It's because most people we encounter will have some abdominal girth. Now, whether that's because of ascites or whatever, spleens are harder to feel when your abdomen is distended. And most people with abdominal disease will probably have a distended abdomen as well. Another thing I like to ask about is blood flow in the superficial veins. It comes up all the time, like clockwork for abdominal finals. Remember one little rule. If you have cirrhosis of the liver and therefore you have portal hypertension, you've got increased resistance of blood flow through the liver, then you will get these dilated veins on the abdomen. And the one rule with them is that the blood flow is always away from the umbilicus. So the blood is basically coming out of the umbilical vein and going outwards. And that's the way the blood is flowing. It's always away from the umbilicus. The differential, which is what the medics want you to know about, is IVC obstruction. If your vena cave obstruction is rare, it can be caused by many things. Classically, it's caused by either clot or cancer uh, in the inferior vena cava. Uh, and it can cause IVC obstruction, which is in itself, you know, it's a medical emergency when it's a proper obstruction. But if you have chronic inferior vena cava obstruction with like tributaries to bypass it, it's not so much of an emergency, but you do get uh, these peripheral kind of dilatations of veins on the abdominal surface. The only difference between these two is while you can get spider nevi in these veins, which are dilated, uh, in IVC obstruction, the blood flow is always upwards, regardless of whether you're away or below the umbilicus. However, with portal hypertension, I've just told you that the blood flow, can I draw on this thing? Give me one second. I'm using my uh, iPad to do this. I don't know if I can draw as well. Let me just try. Okay. Okay, kind of works. All right. This is an abdomen, right? Belly button. If you have portal hypertension, your blood flow is always going out in this direction. 
away from the umbilicus. Therefore, below the umbilicus, the blood flow is actually downwards because it's away from the umbilicus. Sorry, that arrow is meant to be like that. So below the umbilicus, the blood flow is downwards. However, if you have IVC obstruction, then in that situation, your blood flow with your kind of peripheral dilated veins will always be in that direction, whether you're above or below the umbilicus. I hope that makes sense. It's not the most kind of neatly explained word wording I've ever used, but there we go. I've not tried to do this on a drawing before. Let me try and really see if I can delete all this rubbish. Okay, let's see now. Uh, fine, okay. I'll just click next. Okay, the only way you can tell the difference between the two is by seeing flow below the umbilicus. Below the umbilicus in portal hypertension, your blood flow will be away from the umbilicus, whereas it'll be upwards with IPC obstruction, which is the only possible differential really that can, that can exist. Okay, causes. Uh, causes of a large liver. Everyone knows the three Cs, I'm hoping, yeah? There's a, there's a very straightforward mnemonic for this. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a very straightforward kind of aid memoir. It's not quite a mnemonic. Uh, it's the three Cs for hepatomegaly, all right? And, the, and everyone gets taught this in every kind of medical, all the textbooks have the same kind of uh, shorthand to remember this, cirrhosis, CCF carcinoma. Reason you need to know that, therefore, is that because if every textbook teaches it and everyone knows it, you can't be the only person who doesn't know it. Because at medical finals, I'll expect everyone to give me the same answer. And it'll look a bit odd if you're the only person who doesn't know this silly thing. I hate aid memoirs and mnemonics generally. I kind of come up with my own, but this is one of the ones that every medical student knows. So you might as well spend two seconds and just learn this. So cirrhosis, CCF carcinoma is how it's taught. It's not quite right. Cirrhosis, yes, can cause hepatomegaly, but only when it's early. Uh, advanced cirrhosis, the liver actually shrinks overall, and therefore your liver may not be palpable at all in someone with end-stage liver failure because of advanced cirrhosis. So it's not fully accurate. In early cirrhosis, yes, the left lobe in particular will enlarge, and then eventually both lobes will shrink. Congestive cardiac failure can cause hepatomegaly. Yes. Uh, and now as a cardiologist, as you can imagine, I see a lot of people with congestive cardiac failure. It's not that common. It really isn't that to see hepatomegaly and congestive cardiac failure. It can cause it, but it's not frequent at all. The main thing in the heart that causes a hepatomegaly, the main one is tricuspid regurgitation. That's the main one. So it's generally right-sided valvular issue, in particular tricuspid regurgitation, right heart failure, tricuspid regurgitation, anything that increases pressures on the right side of the heart. And the, the reasoning behind that is pretty simple, right? Like if this is your heart, this is your right side, you've got your IVC and SVC, blood's coming in like that. If this ventricle is not handling things well because you've got right ventricular impairment or this valve, the tricuspid valve is leaking, right? And your blood is just regurgitating back and forth. If I can draw an arrow, sorry. Then what you're gonna have is from the IVC uh, and the hepatic vein is you're just gonna have blood going back and forth to the liver. And that's why you get the pulsatile hepatomegaly in right ventricular impairment or right-sided valvular issues. And that's the straightforward explanation for it. And that's why Generally speaking, if it's a cardiac issue causing your hepatomegaly, one thing you can bet on is this definitely involves the right heart. I don't know about the left heart, maybe not, but definitely involves the right heart. And one classic scenario I'll give you, which we see frequently, would be tricuspid regurgitation caused by endocarditis, where the valve just suddenly gives way and you've got severe tricuspid regurgitation. In that situation, the, you know, in the patient who's got a temperature and he's got peripheral emboli and stuff, to have a listen for a murmur because it might well be that they've got tricuspid regurgitation from endocarditis. Come on, there we go. And of course, another cause of a large liver is carcinoma of the liver. Primary hepatocellular carcinoma is actually pretty rare. It's much commoner for other things to metastasize to the liver. That's a commoner thing. So secondary uh, metastasis from another primary source somewhere else, whereas primary liver cancer is actually pretty rare. And the thing I kind of jump past is constrictive pericarditis, just because I think in the space of this talk, I didn't want to get into it in enormous amounts of depth. Uh, congestive cardiac fail, uh, sorry, constrictive pericarditis can cause it can definitely cause right-sided, uh, it can definitely cause increased pressures on the right side, and it can definitely cause 
you to have a hepatomegaly. One classic sign of constriction, if I open up my chat and see if anyone's willing to throw it up. Sorry, guys, I know there's questions. I will come back to them, I promise. For Hannah, apologies. I will come back to that at the end. Can anyone tell me the classic sign of, yeah, constriction, Kussmaul sign. I have a little video on YouTube about this. I only made like a few videos before I gave up because it was just taking too much time. I made one video explaining Kussmaul sign on YouTube. Bizarrely, it's the one that everyone seems to, <laughs> all like 15 people who've seen it have liked it. So there we go. That's, it's clearly a massively popular thing. Uh, but yeah, I have made a video explaining Kussmaul sign and why it's associated with constricted pericarditis and it's on my YouTube channel with two other videos that's it all right so carcinoma of the liver will give you an irregular liver edge remember an irregular liver edge can also be caused by cirrhosis so just remember it's not super specific for carcinoma i threw in another one which is actually pretty common and should probably be in one of the commoner kind of differentials Riedel's lobe is fairly common that's a patient who's got absolutely nothing wrong with them it's just an anatomical variant they're born with Riedel's lobe and it can feel like a hepatomegaly uh, and that's that's all it is Then you get into the weird and wonderful stuff. You can have a big liver because your liver is infiltrated with iron. So hemochromatosis would be the classic one. Patients with hemochromatosis will look tanned at the bedside. They say they have a slate gray pigmentation, but to be completely honest, when you see these patients, slate gray is what happens when it's kind of fairly advanced and quite a lot of iron and been there for a very long time. Early on, they just look like someone who's been to the Mediterranean on holiday. Like it just looks like they have a lot of sunshine exposure. So they can look tanned, more tanned than uh, their ethnic group might suggest even. Uh, and they tend to have type 2 diabetes, which often gets picked up early. So they tend to be diabetic patients with a tan. They also tend to have uh, eventually small testicles and lots of other issues, including arthralgias, because they get uh, pseudogout formation. Autoimmune conditions. I don't know why all of those came up at the same time. Sorry, it should have really come up one at a time. Autoimmune uh, hepatomegaly. Well, obviously you can get autoimmune hepatitis, which tends to be a problem of younger women. But the more commoner one is primary biliary cirrhosis. With PBC, there is a classic question that used to get asked in finals. I don't know if it gets asked anymore, but uh, it was something that I was taught about at finals, which is that this is one of the, one of the only conditions involving liver cirrhosis where you get jaundiced after you get itchy. In most patients who have chronic liver failure for whatever reason, they get jaundiced first and then the high bile salts over time causes pruritus. You know, pruritus is a key sign uh, in cirrhosis. You are, you're asked to look, at, uh, look for signs of pruritus and itching on inspection of the abdomen, et cetera, in patients with liver disease. But actually primary biliary cirrhosis, the pruritus is a very, very early, very early and very key clinical uh, determinator. It's really interesting and no one's quite been able to explain it why itchiness is such a massive problem in these patients. Pretty typically, PVC patients will come to hospital saying, my itchiness is the big problem. That's their presenting complaint. And they tend to get itchy before they get jaundiced, which is the odd thing about this. In every other cause of cirrhosis, they will get itchy, but it'll be after they get jaundiced. In PVC, the itching precedes the jaundice, which is really odd. And the treatment that we can offer them is cholestyramine. It doesn't work super well, but it is a treatment for the itching in particular. There are vascular uh, problems that can cause a large liver. Bud Chiari syndrome classically will cause a uh, cause a enlargement of the liver. It's thrombosis uh, of the uh, of the hepatic vein, and that's typically associated with hematological uh, issues, specifically JAK2 mutation issues, and that would be polycythemia rubra vera, which is what PRV stands for. There. Other things that can make you more likely to clot would be hyperestrogenemia. So pregnancy or the oral contraceptive pill can increase your risk of developing a bud Chiari syndrome. Of course, it's pretty rare. Other things that can cause hepatomegaly, which are infectious. And of course, we must never forget that hepatitis B and C are massive issues in the world. And viral hepatitis can, of course, cause hepatomegaly. It's pretty rare to see leptospirosis in the Western world, but it does exist. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about leptospirosis later on, weirdly enough. So I'm going to skip uh, past this so I don't take up too much time here. And of course, you can get hepatomegaly with both uh, hematological malignancies and uh, malignancies such as lymphoma. So you can get it with leukemias, lymphomas, your liver can enlarge. I'll give you one good tip for the liver, for SBAs. If you read the words hepatic venous hum, that means this patient has portal hypertension. That's what hepatic venous hum is absolutely pathognomonic for. If you read that, then that just, that's the examiner telling you this patient has portal hypertension. 
It's a very rare thing to hear. It's a continuous murmur. I've never heard it. That's how I've seen it described in the books. I actually don't think I've ever met anyone who's heard a hepatic venous hum. So it's one of these things that exists in books and we write questions on it, even though we don't know what it sounds like. Uh, so <laughs> welcome to medical finals. Uh, it's a, it's a apparently pathognomonic for portal hypertension and it only exists as far as I'm aware and as far as you should care uh, as a little novelty that we write SBAs about. That's about it. Okay. Now, SBAs are best done with actually doing SBAs. Have a read of this question. I'm going to pull up the poll and I'll share this with you. Give me one second. I think this question is... Now, this is where I forget which one this is. I think it's this one. Uh, let me read the question, see if I remember what the answer was. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to share this, but it's struggling to open for some stupid reason. Come on. It's giving me an error. Okay, it's really odd. Why don't I give you the, I can see the five options, but it won't let me share it with you. I will read out the options. Uh, unfortunately, I can't get you to click, but why don't you mentally click and uh, I can give you the options. A 27 year old woman presents with dull aching pain at the costal margin for three weeks. Her past medical history is unremarkable. She takes the oral contraceptive pill, uh, which she has used for six years and drinks one or two glasses of wine on social occasions, doesn't use tobacco, illicit drugs. It's important to ask about illicit drugs because actually if you use anabolic steroids, uh, they can cause uh, hepatitis or even cirrhosis chronically. Um, temperature is 36.7. Uh, uh, sorry, the other thing, of course, with illicit drugs is whether you're injecting stuff because then you've got the risk of hep B and hep C, but anabolic steroids as well. Uh, treat temperature is 36.7, so she's not inflamed. The temperature is fine. Blood pressure is okay. Pulse is 60. Great. Okay, so this patient doesn't sound like she's very sick, just on objective markers. She doesn't sound unwell. Examination shows hepatomegaly with moderate discomfort on deep palpation in the right upper quadrant. There is no jaundice or ascites. Now, if there is no jaundice or ascites, and by implication, there's one other thing missing from this, which is she doesn't have encephalop encephalopathy, then this patient doesn't have decompensation of the liver. That's one thing that cannot possibly exist. This patient is not in decompensated liver disease, for sure, because to be decompensated, you need to have jaundice, ascites, plus or minus encephalopathy. That's the thing you need to have. So if they don't have any of that, they're not decompensated. So the one thing as a medical registrar, I can stand back and say, okay, this patient's not going to die in the next hour, probably from this. This is, uh, I can sit back and actually think about this. The options I would give you here are as follows. I would give you, da, 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 uh, okay, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, and the way I've said it now means that definitely isn't the right answer. I'd give you a, uh, a hepatic adenoma. I would give you as an option for this, probably PBC. Uh, I would probably give you PSC as well. And I would give you finally as an option, I don't know, I'd probably throw in a syndrome to scare you. Like, uh, I don't know. Uh, why don't we say Whipple's disease? There we go. I picked something, which clearly isn't the right answer, but I picked something. Uh, and I'd give you those as an option. Why don't you put in your chat... I don't think anyone can see the chat. Does anyone want to hazard a guess? Someone's gone for PBC, hepatic adenoma, Lynn says. Sorry, I'm not going to use in people's names. Someone says hepatic adenoma. Hepatocellular carcinoma, PSC. All right, let's pause there, okay? It, first of all, well done who everyone for braving it. It's always a little bit brave, uh, you know, to put yourself on the spot because it takes, it's a weird psychological hit we take, even if we get it wrong when there's no consequence with people that don't really matter. Uh, and I don't matter and no one here who's listening actually matters. But the people who actually go for stuff like that and put their hand up and give an answer, they're the ones who never forget the answer then after that afterwards. So I do think it's one of those psychological things that you should try and push yourselves out for because once you, even if you make a mistake, you will never forget it after that. The options I gave you included hepatocellular carcinoma and hepatic adenoma. It's one of those two. It's not hepatocellular carcinoma, okay? This patient is 27. The chances of her having liver cancer, primary liver cancer, are vanishingly small. It's not that. This is a benign liver tumor. This is a hepatic adenoma. 
That's what this is. This is a benign epithelial tumor associated with young women taking the oral contraceptive pill. It's been well described and it can malignantly transform in the future. Most people who come in with this will probably have it surgically resected uh, electively. So they will probably have it taken out, but it is associated with the pill. It's associated particularly in young women taking the pill and it's just an epithelial uh, tumor and it is indeed completely benign. The other things I talked about PBC, first of all, why does this patient not have PBC? Does anyone want to counter that and tell me why does this not sound like PBC? And someone says PSC as well. Yeah, no itching. Okay, tell me what a PBC patient looks like, right? The typical patient with PBC at the bedside will be a middle-aged woman, 90% of the time. Middle-aged woman. She's a bit too young, okay? Fine, you can say, well, 27, you know, everyone is so old after 21, as you kids probably think. But the thing is, even 27 is pretty young. And the other thing is, what do they look like? If, you, if I put a patient in front of you, how could you tell immediately this patient has PBC? just by looking at their face. They have something there. Xanthal asthma. Patients with PBC have hyperlipidemia and xanthal asthma. If they have xanthal asthma, it's very, very like, I mean, if you see a middle-aged woman with xanthal asthma, okay, yeah, fine. It might just be a Western diet and they have high cholesterol or they have familial hypercholesterolemia. It's possible. But uh, if they are itchy at all or jaundice, you really need to think whether it could be primary biliary cirrhosis. Is a Bud Chiari syndrome possible? I'm being asked. Well, not really. Although I see why you've said that. I didn't put that in the differentials, which maybe would be a good differential for a finally a paper when I rework some of these questions. Uh, Bud Chiari would be a good one because I've said the pill and most people think, ah, oral contraceptive pill in a woman, Bud Chiari syndrome. The thing is, Bud Chiari is kind of almost like a medical emergency. You've basically closed off one major vessel to the liver and it enlarges and the patient is super sick. Does this patient sound super sick? Pulse of 60, blood pressure 120, 80, temperature 36, 7. She doesn't sound unwell. How are you going to block off the hepatic vein and be this well? It's just not possible. So this is unlikely to be Bud Chiari syndrome, just based on the fact that she's clinically not that unwell yet, right? It's just not, it doesn't make much sense uh, for this to be a Bud Chiari. It could be very rapid, but the more thing is, the more important thing is in Bud Chiari, the patient is super unwell. It's not something that you're normally smiling about. Uh, and the, those patients just, it just wouldn't be feasible to present like this. All right. I'm hoping my next one works. It's just that one question for some reason. Okay. Try and do this. I'm going to try and reopen the poll and see if I can get this thing to work. Da, 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 da. Come on, damn it, share. Oh, okay. It's done something there. I think you guys can see it. Let's see if people start answering stuff. A patient presents with jaundice and abdominal pain. He admits to excessive alcohol consumption as a tender two centimeter hepatomegaly. On examination, there is splenic enlargement, evidence of spider nevi, caput medusae, palm erythema, gynecomastia, deprotrins contractures, and parotid swelling. His blood tests show a macrocytic anemia with a hemoglobin of 74. A blood film shows acanthocytes, haptoglobins are reduced, and LDH is elevated. Ah, I love questions like this. You know why I like questions like this? Because most people are getting them wrong. Uh, and that's why I like them. Now, suddenly the answers will slow down because I've said that. And the <laughs> mixture of answers are going to change as people who jumped on alcohol immediately pause and think, hang on a second. Uh, could this be something else? Okay, maybe it's not that. Now they're thinking, okay, he's put two random syndromes in there, with both of which I haven't heard about. It's got to be one of the two random syndromes. So by process of elimination, it's going to be 50-50. Which one am I going to go for? And now people are picking one of the syndromes. But of course, I could have said that to just confuse you away from the correct answer. What am I doing here? See, this is the way examiners think. Uh, examiners always have an internal bet. This is all the in internal workings of how I write papers with my colleagues, because uh, we <laughs> there's not that many people interested in writing papers. We try and pick questions which are not super mean, but one or two of them are super mean. And we like to see if we can pick a question which really throws most medical students. As the, uh, the point isn't to fail you, because it'll be like one out of 100 questions. Uh, but it, it's the point is just to kind of really see who understands their medicine. And these are all legitimate questions, just a little bit mean. I'm, and I do apologize that I take so much pleasure in this. All right, 59 people have answered. Uh, out of 100, I'm going to end the poll now. Let's see. Should I share the results? It's always nice to see this. 10% of people got it right. Six people went for Zeev syndrome and got it right. Uh, and that's the correct answer. The answer is Zeev syndrome. What has this patient got? Let's, let's talk through it logically. What's going on here? This is a patient with jaundice and abdominal pain. Yeah. 
So it's something liver-like, it sounds like to me from there. He admits to excessive alcohol consumption as a tender to symptom to hepatic. Fine, alcoholic hepatitis, could well be. On examination, there is splenic enlargement, evidence of spider nevi, caput medusae. I, want, I went to town here giving him every single thing. I didn't, I didn't put leukonychia because that's cirrhosis, but I put quite a lot of stuff for portal hypertension. Yeah, so I could have actually put leukonychia as well. Splenic enlargement means portal hypertension. Evidence of spider nevi means hyperestrogenemia. So spider nevi is something you would uh, generate uh, because of increased estrogen to testosterone ratio in the blood, which is typical for cirro cirrhosis patients. They have increased estrogen to testosterone, and the consequences of that are gynecomastia, loss of secondary sexual characteristics in men, of course, uh, and uh, evidence of spider nevi because of peripheral vasodilatation. What's the other consequence? They can get palmar erythema. If I was uh, is sitting in front of you in the lecture theater, this is when I would say every girl and every guy just find one of the opposite uh, sex to look at each other and hold up your hands to each other. Women tend to have redder palms than men. And that's partly because increased free estrogen in blood causes increased peripheral vasodilatation. So their palms tend to be redder. Palm erythema is a sign of hyperestrogenemia. Caput medusae is a sign of portal hypertension. Uh, gynecomastia we've already discussed. Dubitrin's contractors is actually quite a good sign specifically for alcoholic cirrhosis in particular, as is parotid gland swelling. So this is all telling me this guy drinks. The blood tests show a macrocytic anemia. Why might he be macrocytic? Well, your MCV goes up when you drink. So that's one reason, right? But he's also got a proper drop in hemoglobin. That's, that's, that's lower than I would expect in, a, in a, someone with just an alcoholic hepatitis. You could say, well, he may be vomiting blood. It could be variceal hemorrhage. Yeah, that's, that's not a bad shout. Of course, I've not mentioned that he's got uh, any evidence of um, melina or vomiting of, or hematemesis. Like I, I just, uh, I haven't mentioned that. We'd be kind of guessing. But then I've kind of thrown this random hematology at the end. The blood cells show acanthocytes, haptoglobins are reduced, LDH is elevated. He's clearly hemolyzing. This is he hemolysis. Haptoglobins are down, LDH is up. This is hemolytic anemia. And the, there is a cause of hemolytic anemia associated, which I can see a lot of people have already mentioned in the chat. Well done. That's called Zeev syndrome. If you hadn't heard about it, you heard about it now. I have seen questions written about this. I've written one or two questions about this for medical finals. There are a few random syndromes you need to know about. This is one of them. Hemolytic anemia and alcoholic hepatitis together. The one thing that we never put in the question, but also exists if you kind of look it up, is they can have a transient hypertriglyceridemia. That's just a bit of extra, which you don't need to know. The only other syndrome I mentioned, which is a bit random, is Stoffer syndrome, which you also need to know about. I have seen it come up. Surgeons like this question because it's paraneoplastic syndrome associated with renal cell carcinoma, and it causes cholestasis. So these are patients with cholestatic jaundice and renal cell cancer. And of course, as soon as I say renal cell cancer, your final year mind should go straight over to cannonball metastases on x-rays and things like that, or having a large hypernephroma with, uh, with a high hemoglobin count because of excessive production of erythropoietin, blah, blah, blah. So all your kind of knowledge should be linked up in this big web in your mind where one thing just jumps to another. Eventually, that's going to happen. This is all start of final year, so don't worry if it's not there yet. It's coming. So key takeaways from that question, alcohol, dupotrens, and parotid swelling. Those two things are pretty specific for alcohol. A good question at finals is what bloods would you look at if you think this patient was consuming alcohol? And people will come up with gamma GT, which is a good answer. It's absolutely true. The AST to ALT ratio is generally two to one, so AST above ALT uh, will be there. A more useful test, which people sometimes miss, is MCV is actually much more sensitive and specific for recent alcohol consumption. You will find macrocytosis. The reason that particular patient was macrocytic, by the way, is not just that they're drinking alcohol, is the fact that they have reticular cytosis. They've had, uh, they've had hemolysis and they've had reticulocytes early uh, red cell precursors from the bone marrow exiting the bone marrow to try and keep the hemoglobin normal and they tend to be larger and you can get a macrocytosis just from that. Let's go back to where we were. Sorry, I don't know how to get rid of these circles once I've drawn. I'm not going to draw anymore. All right. So cirrhosis in general gives you some of some very classic kind of features. So hyperestrogenemia, we've already discussed. Portal hypertension, discussed. Ascites is generally pretty common with portal hypertension. How much ascites do you need to have in your abdomen before you will find uh, dullness in the flanks? Because just because you don't have dullness in the flanks doesn't mean you don't have ascites. You need to have at least 1.5 liters, not 500 mils, 1.5 liters. And some books would say two liters. Uh, it depends. But the studies that I've looked at 
say at least 1.5 liters. So you can have up to a liter and a half of ascites in there and still clinically have no sign of ascites. So just because you can't find it doesn't mean it's not there. The best way to look for it, of course, is with some kind of imaging. Uh, CT, ultrasound, ultrasound is without radiation, so you can go for that, uh, would be a reasonable one. And here I'm going to throw in a question for the people who are going for a prize this year. What would you expect the serum sodium to be in a patient who has... Uh, I'm going to come back to that. Farhana, it's a good question. I will come back to that. It's not actually. Fluid thrill is not a better test for ascites than, than, than dullness in the uh, flanks. Someone did that study a few years ago and found that actually dullness in the flanks is a better test. It's more sensitive. But uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, what would you expect the serum sodium to be in this patient? And someone says low. C says low. Uh, you are quite right. Why is the more difficult question. Can anyone venture a guess while I have a sip of my coffee? Yeah, yeah. then we get this mishmash of words, which are all kind of right. Renal angiotensin, aldosterone system, dehydration, fluid overload. So here's the thing. The serum sodium is low, okay? If you hyperactivate your renal angiotensin, aldosterone system, what are you retaining at the end of that? Are you getting rid of sodium when you activate your renin angiotensin, aldosterone system? No, exactly. You actually are retaining sodium. So why is the serum sodium low? Yeah, but you keep water too. So why is it low? Shouldn't it be normal? <laughs> Something to do with albumin, question mark. Uh, not quite, because it shouldn't affect sodium unless it's massive shifts in albumin, and then it's only transient extravasation. No, no, no. It's actually really simple. Yeah, you're going to kick yourself. All right, here we go. A little bit of medical uh, physiology. So in patients with cirrhosis and portal hypertension, and to be honest, in, with ascites, if they have clinical ascites, you can pretty much bet that their sodium will be a little bit low. It won't be like 104, but it'll be like 125, 127. It'll be kind of lower border normal. It'll, it'll definitely be just off the end, and it'll be a bit low. So why does sodium drop with cirrhotic ascites or portal hypertension or whatever you want to call it? It's simply this. Once you have and maybe I should have a full screen for this. Um, can I give myself, give me one sec. Let me generate some more space. Okay. If you have a liver, which is failing with a smiley face, uh, well, it's actually a frowny face, right? Because it's failing. If the liver is failing, then here's the problem that develops you get peripheral splanc splanchnic vasodilatation. That's absolutely true. You get increased vasodilatation in the periphery. And if anyone asks you why that happens, it's multifactorial. But one of the reasons is you're only hanging on to nitrogenous waste, and that tends to cause vasodilatation. You're hanging on to a lot more estrogen. And well, you're not hanging on to estrogen. You have more estrogen in the peripheries, which can cause peripheral vasodilatation. But more importantly, peripherally, you get more nitric oxide. Uh, which causes vasodilatation. So as far as the rest of your body is concerned, your blood pressure is actually low or your body's receptors detect that your blood pressure is low. Whether it actually is or not is beside the point. Your body in its microvasculature, these receptors are being told the blood pressure is low. Okay, so you are being told or rather your receptors are being told your blood pressure is low. Let's just go back to basic physiology that you guys remember doing in first and second year and loved it when you did endocrinology, right? Remember, everyone loved it. So you have your kidneys and you've got uh, your kidneys with the, with the little adrenal glands and everything. Uh, don't make me draw the kidneys. Uh, one of the things that's going to happen is if, you're, if, you, if I just drop your blood pressure, if you right now listening to me lost a pint of blood because you'd accidentally you know, had a rugby accident or whatever, you hurt yourself touch, but it'll never happen. But you lost a little bit of blood and your blood pressure actually drops. Your body would activate its renin angiotensin aldosterone system to hang on to salt and water. Yeah. And increase your blood pressure and hang on to salt and water to try and preserve losing more fluid. And it will decrease salt and water loss from the kidneys. That's one thing that will happen. So you will hang on to so, the stupid pen. Sorry about this, guys. Salt and water. That's not me being unable to write English. That's just my stupid Apple pencil not working. So salt and water 
will be retained. However, if you're retaining salt and you're retaining water, your sodium concentration really shouldn't shift. There is one other hormone that we're missing here. Has anyone mentioned it? Let me just open the chat. What's the other hormone that'll be activated when you're really unwell? Well done, vasopressin, antidiuretic hormone. And what happens when your ADH comes into play, which is, a, which is a stress hormone, and it'll be there as soon as you become unwell, is you will retain pure water in particular. So while you are actually retaining more sodium, if I was to measure every bit of sodium in someone with cirrhosis, it would be higher than all of us. They have a lot more sodium than we do, definitely. But they have even more water and their sodium is being drowned out by the water. So they are retaining water by ADH and by, um, and by the renal angiotensin aldosterone system, but they're only retaining sodium by one of them. Does that make sense? And you're basically drowning out the sodium. And that's simply why they have, even though their whole body sodium is actually high, their serum sodium, when you measure it, is low. And that's purely because they have retained so much more fluid, so much more water compared to the sodium. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, I will take this question quickly because I don't want to, I don't take questions during because as you can see, I'm running over uh, and you still have like six slides to go. So I will take this question quickly. Uh, can I ask, can the extravasation to the intestinal space due to the low albumin also be a cause of activation of the unit? I'm sure it can. Um, the problem with questions like, can it ever happen is the answer is almost always, yeah, I'm sure it can. Uh, it probably is. It's, it's multifactorial. With cirrhosis, it's such a multi-system disease. You're attacking the body's physiology from so many points that actually, I'm sure it is part of the answer. But it's just based on the current, and I say this as someone who's been to very recent talks on this from professors, uh, because based on the current understanding of the physiology, what I've mentioned would be the key determinators of what's happening. I'm sure what you're saying is probably also part of the answer. It's multifactorial. One thing we know is that the ADH levels in these patients is ask high. Okay, let's move on to something more fun, like another SBA. A 30-year-old comes to, let me see if this one work. I'm going to shut poll. Sorry, guys, I'm running over again. Every time I try and reduce the slides, it doesn't work. I'm going to reduce it more. It's because I keep poking. All right, a 32-year-old comes to the emergency department, uh, and why don't you read the rest? I'm going to pull up the questions for you. Okay, I'm going to share this question with you in two seconds. First of all, I'm going to read this with you. A 32-year-old comes to the emergency department due to a week of right costal margin pain, malaise, anorexia, fever. Six months ago, he returned. he returned from India, where he hiked in the mountains during this trip. The patient had several self-resolving episodes of diarrhea. He drank one can of beer a day. Which, by the way, if I was taking the history and I heard that, I just think he's lying. Like, no one drinks just one can of beer a day. Because if you like beer, one can is a bit of a random number to just stop at. Uh, and, it, like, I don't think people who like beer drink that, uh, drink that amount. It just seems a bit random. So I, I would immediately assume that's a lie. Uh, but stopped after his recent symptoms began. Temperature is 38.5. So he's got a growing temperature. But blood pressure is okay. And the pulse is a little high, but it's okay. Blood uh, the breath sounds are decreased in the right lung base, which is interesting. The liver is palpable three centimeters below the right costal margin with a tender, smooth liver edge. Now, I would assume this guy has some kind of hepatitis, just listening to this. I think this question is a little bit mean. I can come up with the answer for this, but only because I think MRCP candidates probably can. Uh, if I ask people what it was just based on this, don't answer the question yet. I'm going to launch the poll, but don't answer it yet. I'll give you one more clue, which will help. Okay, so those are your options. Don't answer it yet. Okay, some people have gone for it, but I was going to say pause for two seconds and I'm going to give you one more clue, which may change your answer. This guy then has a needle biopsy and you find anchovy paste like substance coming out from the needle biopsy of his liver. Yeah, there we go. Now we get the correct answers. See, this is the, the issue because actually the people who jumped in early. Yeah, they, they, those question the answers would not be correct for multiple reasons in this history. This history wouldn't fit. I'm going to give it 10 seconds and I'm going to stop. So if you're going to get the answer and get it in now, otherwise hold your peace. In the meantime, what I'm going to try and do is see if I can sort out the stupid. Come on, get rid of my 
pen edge. All right, never mind. PowerPoint is not behaving for me. So I'm just going to end the poll there. I'm going to share the results. And 42% of people, a plurality, have got it correct. The correct answer, just pipping leptospirosis for some reason, is entamoeba histolytica. So I kind of had a dilemma when I was thinking of what to teach today because I kind of thought, I'm not going to teach you all of hepatology in 45 minutes or an hour, how long this ends up being. I, I kind of thought I'm going to need to teach them something they probably aren't going to be taught somewhere else. So I assumed everyone is going to go to some talk or be really well taught on hepatology and portal hypertension and cirrhosis. I didn't want to dwell on it too much. I thought I'd give you a little bit of parasitic and infectious medicine because I thought this stuff comes up in finals. And I got to be honest, I don't think people teach it in revision courses well enough. So Entamoeba histolytica is associated with travelers dysentery and liver abscess, okay? If I was writing this question for finals, if it was me, I would put in this pathognomonic sign because I, I would expect medical students to go reading for this. Anchovy paste is what is described. I should put this in inverted commas. Anchovy paste is what it's described as. Uh, the little liquid that comes out of the liver cyst when you stick a needle in. I have to say, we tend not to do this in clinical practice anymore. We tend to make this diagnosis using uh, serology, so looking for antibodies and things. The treatment is metronidazole. Uh, and just to, to remind everyone, that's what it looks like. It's delicious, uh, of course. Okay, so that's entamoeba histolytica. Why is this not gyardia? Well, you can get traveler's diarrhea with gyardia, but it's not dysentery, so it's not bloody. It tends to be a malabsorbed diarrhea, so you get stools which are difficult to flush away, watery diarrhea, etc. It's also caused by a protozoal parasite. Schistosomiasis can come after swimming in fresh water. So if I don't have that in the history, I'm not uh, reading any further. It can't be schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis, typically, when I was a medical student, uh, way back in 2010, you know, when we used to just give uh, uh, most medications were just a firm handshake and a blessing. Schistosomiasis is just uh, patients who used to come in after having a swim in the River Nile or something. So freshwater swimming tended to be Egypt, but it can be anywhere uh, in, in North Africa and several other countries. Uh, typically, they, you find these patients have eosinophilia. These are, I'm just giving you bullet points that tend to be associated with this in SBAs. They tend to, be, they tend to have portal hypertension. It's actually the commonest worldwide cause of portal hypertension, or one of the commonest after the hepatitis viruses. And chronic schistosomiasis also causes something random in surgical cases, which is squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. What's the commonest, uh, commonest type of carcinoma you can get in the bladder? Sorry, I know I'm not a surgeon, but I might as well use what limited knowledge I have. Ryan says TCC, which is transitional cell carcinoma. You're absolutely right, Ryan. Uh, and iPad and Sarah Verning, you're all correct. Transitional cell carcinoma is the commonest in the Western world. Across the whole world, the commonest type is squamous cell carcinoma, and it's caused by schistosomiasis. Leptospirosis is, a is relatively rare. I've seen one patient with it, actually. It's not that rare. So... It's caused by infected water sources. Uh, and these patients have a combination of renal failure and jaundice, and it's called Wheels disease. Uh, so it tends to be this, this random combination of kidney failure plus jaundice. I'm sure you can get diarrhea, but that patient did not have renal failure. Whipple's disease, which uh, I can't remember, wasn't in my diagram. Yeah, it is in my differentials there. So Whipple's disease, uh, which two people went for, is associated with malabsorption. So you get the stools which are hard to flush away. They tend to have arthralgias, which is an interesting one, because not many things will cause malabsorption arthralgia outside of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but that tends not to be arthralgia per se, and they tend to have fever as well. They, uh, the diagnosis is made with this pathognomonic finding, which is positive, uh, pos positive acid shift macrophages in small bowel biopsy, PAS positive macrophages in small bowel uh, biopsy. Okay, coming up to the last, quite literally the last like three slides. You guys still with me? Well, you don't have to be with me. You can go wherever you want. No one's holding you here. All right, a 40-year-old Chinese gentleman presents for a routine hernia repair and he's fit and well. He's completely fine. His bloods show a hep B surface antigen positive. His bloods show a hep B E antigen positive and his bloods show a hep B C antibody positive. So surface antigen, E antigen and core antibody positive. He doesn't drink alcohol. He's never had a blood transfusion. Okay, let's stop sharing. I think I don't have any more polls for this one. Did I put a poll question up here? No, I thought I wanted to, I did this on a bit of a whim actually. Uh, so 
I'm going to open the chat and give you guys two seconds. Why doesn't someone share with me? What did they think? Because this is clearly a hepatitis B question. I'll give you a bunch of options like, okay, he has no hepatitis B. He's hepatitis B previously exposed, but fully vac uh, fully kind of cleared, or he's actively infected. I'll give you those three options. And someone says carrier from previous exposure. Is he actively infectious or not? Just give me that. Is he actively infected or not? Is he infectious or not? The reason he's come for this routine hernia repair, he's come to a preoperative clinic where we're doing kind of standard stuff because we need to protect the nurses, the surgeons, everyone who's going to get, get in touch with his blood. That's why we do these tests. Yeah, he's actively infectious. If you have hepatitis B E antigen, this is the point of this question. Even though he is completely fine clinically, if you are E antigen positive, you are infectious right now. That's what that means. So having E antigen positivity means he is infectious. He is actually actively infectious and almost certainly a chronic, a chronically infected uh, hepatitis B carrier. Absolutely. Patients with hep B tend to have stiff joints. There are a bunch of antibodies and antigens. Remember this, if they're surface antibody positive, if they have this antibody, then they're protected. That means they've either previously encountered this, uh, this virus and cleared it, or it could be like a healthcare worker and they've had hepatitis B vaccination. That's what the surface antibody positivity tells you. Then if they have core antibody, that means they definitely previously encountered this virus alive. They could only have core antibody in their system if their body encountered the core of this virus at some point. And that means this patient definitely had an infection with hep B in the past. I'm not, I don't know if it's there right now, but it was there in the past for sure. If they are surface antigen positive, that means they are actually infected right now. That could be chronic or active. And then the sign of e antigen tells you it's an active infection. The, that's the way to look at these antibodies. I am oversimplifying it. Uh, hepatitis B serology is actually a bit of a niche area among hepatologists, and they tend to be experts on this, of course. But as far as the general medic goes, this pretty much covers you for everything. And the treatment is, well, the treatment's evolving depending on which country you're in, but the most recent guideline we have says PEG interferon alpha and either, and it's one of these antivirals. But of course, this will change depending on local guidelines. So you don't have to hang on my word for this. Everyone's kind of, it depends a little bit on your local genotypes and all that kind of stuff. All right, final question, then we're done. I'm sorry, guys, I've overrun this. Even though I actually released the slides from last time, I think they would answer, and there's just more to talk about. Okay, uh, let's share this. I think the polls are working now. Yeah, there we go. Fine, last question. A 20-year-old man presents with progressive jaundice and bronchitis. He's got a two-year history of intermittent bloody diarrhea. Yes, yeah, this is probably too easy. Uh, two, uh, intermittent bloody diarrhea and weight loss, a colonoscopy and biopsy shows, blah, blah, blah. So he's clearly got... He's clearly got what sounds like ulcerative colitis, right? That's what this sounds like. Oral 5 ASA and corticosteroid aminos have mostly controlled things, but he has had extreme fatigue the last few months. And if he was drained by the end of the day, blah, 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 cholestatic picture, which antibody is likely to be raised? Okay, I am going to stop sharing. Who only had 15 responses? Come on, come on, come on. Finally, your medical students. Show me what you're made of, guys. I know it's early, but if you did third year uh, exams, this is very similar to that. You do realize I can't see who's picking what answers. All I have is a graph at the end of this. So I have no idea who gets this right or wrong. No one else will know. It's just you who will know. So I'm going to stop sharing this now. The, the trick with SBAs, can I just say, is not that, oh, I just know the answer out of five immediately. It's how do I eliminate the three most obviously wrong answers? Then it's like, then it's not 20%. Then it's like 50-50. You just got to improve your odds, right? You got to improve your odds from 20% to 50, 50. You just got to think, well, that's clearly nonsense. That's clearly nonsense. That doesn't make sense. And then you just got to think with the examiner between these final two, which one is the examiner trying to get me to go for just to, uh, just to kind of screw with me. And that's how you got to think how these questions are written. That is how I write them. Right? The correct answer here is indeed P anchor positivity. Uh, it's the most likely one to be raised most likely want to be raised. That doesn't mean they'll definitely be raised. It's just the most likely. So this is primary sclerosing cholangitis. That's what this is. It's associated mostly with, in, uh, with men who have ulcerative colitis. Of course, you can have it with Crohn's as well, and you can have it with women. But mostly, it's men with UC. P anchor can become positive. It causes obstructive jaundice. 
you get this classic pathognomonic finding on ERCP called beads on the string because of stricturing of the um, because of the stricturing you get in the uh, in the bile duct, and you can also find it with MRI MRCP. The reason PSC is important is simply this. It gives you a one in five risk for cholangiocarcinoma, which carries a terrible mortality. And it's, it's the single strongest risk factor for this pretty bad cancer that you can get. You can treat it with acidioxycholic acid, which actually, interestingly enough, is also something we use to treat PBC. What this medication will do is it'll improve your LFTs. It won't actually improve your mortality, but it'll make the blood test look a bit better. The symptoms won't really change. Uh, ultimately, the only real treatment is a liver transplant. By contrast, PBC are women, mostly 90% plus, with xanthalasma, pruritus, and jaundice. There is no indication in PBC that these patients have any, any link with having inflammatory bowel disease. The antibody they tend to get is anti-mitochondrial antibody M2, specifically subtype. I would expect every final year to say anti-mitochondrial antibody. I would expect the ones who are wanting to impress me and be recommended for a prize to say anti-mitochondrial M2. Autoimmune hepatitis, there are three types and they all have different antibodies. So type one is the commonest. ANA can become positive. The more specific one is anti-smooth muscle antibody and they also need to have high uh, IgG levels. Type two is rarer. They have anti-LKM1 antibodies. And type three, you get uh, liver pancreas antigen or soluble liver antigen antibodies. This is pretty rare type three. I've just put it in for completeness, but uh, that's about it. Okay, guys, that is actually the last slide. It always ends with a bang. Uh, anyone who's got questions, please put it in the chat. You don't have to disappear immediately. Uh, I do have a plea. Next week, uh, the surgeon I've recruited to teach with me, who is uh, absolutely excellent, is a registrar uh, in general surgery. And actually he wanted to do orthopedics for ages before he did general surgery uh, from my memory. So I, uh, I think he's going to be a fantastic tutor. Please do come for that. We've never done a surgical talk before. And uh, I'm really looking forward to actually covering all of medical finals. Uh, if, uh, if what's my YouTube channel, you can find intelligent finals on YouTube. That's it. Uh, and it's only got a couple of videos, but they're all right.